Welcome everybody to another edition of Coffee and Open Source, a place to meet some new friends, have some great conversations, and maybe learn something along the way. I'm your host, Isaac Levin, and if you're enjoying the interviews that we're having here, be sure to like, subscribe, follow wherever you're watching or listening. Also, if you're interested or know any folks that would be interested in coming on and chatting, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. My handle there is Isaac R. Levin. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get to our guest. I gotta get my coffee ready. Coffee is ready. All right, I'm super excited for my guest today. My guest is Eric Lawrence. Eric, do you wanna say hello, introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Eric Lawrence. I am a principal program manager on the Edge PM team for the web platform. Uh, I worked at Microsoft now twice, uh, this time for four years. Uh, prior to that, about 12 years, uh, and in the middle, I worked uh, at Pelerick on Fiddler, which was my side project that they acquired, uh, and then I did two and a half years on the Chrome security team. That's awesome. Uh, I, I got a lot of questions that I have for also, because it seems to me like you are an expert in the browser space, and I love talking about browsers, so hopefully we can get into it. Um, but first, I'd love to kind of get to know you a bit more. I'd like to hear, you know, if you have a great story as it pertains to like your origin in tech. Like, do you remember a particular point in time when, you know, you were first introduced to tech or you came across software development in general and you saw it and you're like, that's what I want to do. That's the rest of my life right there. Let's do it. So, yeah, I mean, it's a fun question. I think the, the truth is you know, when I was a kid, I was going to be an astronaut. Uh, no, sure. no doubt in my mind about it until I was about 11 or 12 years old. Um, but throughout that, one of the things that kind of struck me was, you know, some of the other kids were really interested in, you know, space and things like that. And over time, I sort of realized that I was actually not particularly interested in things like astronomy or um, the, the science aspects of space. I was purely interested in the vehicles, the technology sure. around the vehicles. And so that was, you know, part of it. Um, you know, maybe there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance there. Uh, my vision was not good enough to be a, a fighter pilot, which you, you know, at the time basically needed to be a jet pilot in order to, to successfully fly space shuttles. Um, and so, you know, part of it, I think that might have helped for the pivot to tech, but really it was around this idea that technology was uh, super interesting. And so uh, I grew up pretty early in tech. My first computer was a Commodore Plus 4, I think that okay. my parents brought home because we visited a timeshare or something. Uh, we didn't really learn to do much with that other than uh, change the color on the screen. It had, you know, your standard basic interpreter and you learn if you type color space one, it would change to blue or whatever. Yeah. Um, but a kid down the block got a PCXT, and so we played a bunch of games on his PCXT, uh, and that kind of got me interested. And then uh, we got a 286 around 86 or 87, uh, and I really kind of got into basic. And so I wrote, you know, space adventure games that were text adventures. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to go this way or that way? Choose your own adventure style. Um, and we had Apple II uh, in our classroom in fourth and fifth grade. And so I was writing uh, code for that. And so I've been writing code since, you know, code of, of one form or another since I was probably about eight or nine, I think. And uh, so, you know, I was doing the software thing for a while. In high school, um, I met a guy who was also sort of into writing code. And my high school had a, you know, a computer science option uh, that... Sure was not really, uh, didn't have a curriculum. It was taught by the typing teacher. Okay. Uh, and so we made kind of a deal pretty early on. We said, hey, we're going to just write code all semester and you can grade us at the end. And so that was kind of the deal we had. Um, that guy ended up uh, being my roommate in college uh, and also ended up at Microsoft out of college. Uh, and so we've been kind of challenging each other uh, over the years. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I kind of fell into tech. It wasn't sort of any grand vision. Um, but you know, from, from the time I was about 11 or so, I kind of figured I would end up doing something with computers. Yeah. I mean that, I, I think you might be the youngest entrant in, you know, since, and I've been doing these chats for like two years. I don't know. I can't, I, I'll have to go look at some of the, the old videos, but I feel like you might be the youngest person that had decided, I mean, when I was eight or nine, I probably had no idea like what I wanted for food that night, right? Let alone being super interested in computers. What was it about computers? Just like the vast options? Was it like the gaming thing, like being able to play games? 
Yeah, you know, I've always been in, you know, kind of interested in games. Like we had a Nintendo when I was about nine or eight or nine or so. And so like gaming is definitely an entrance. But one of the things about games is like I, I frequently would find that, you know, I would get bored with games. And even now, like if I buy a game, I'll usually play it for a little, you know, a, a few days and then just kind of be like, you know, I'm done with that. Um I think it's really the aspect of creation. Uh, so one of the sort of alternate history things that you can do with yourself is like, what if you lived a hundred years ago? Like, what would you do? Uh, and for me, I'm pretty sure I would be an author. Uh, I really enjoy writing. I like the, the process of creation. I don't have, you know, the set of talents to be really an artist uh, or, or perhaps the patience uh, for art, but the idea of sort of creating worlds and expounding upon those uh, is really interesting to me. Um, you know, fairly logical and, you know, I like math and things like that, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not, you know, super into that realm. It's really, I think the aspect of creation. And yeah. so early on it was, you know, exploring the machine. I mean, you got an Apple II, like at least by the time it made it to us, there's no manual, there's a yeah. little blinking yeah. cursor and you've got to figure out how to make it do stuff. And so, you know, there's an aspect of that. It's kind of funny because, it's one of my criticisms now, you know, I've been trying to get my kids into Minecraft. I'm like, there's no instruction. Like, how do you learn it? And it's like YouTube, dad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, at the time there was no YouTube. The best yeah. you know you could find is like, oh, some other kids into this. And he figured out that if you, you know, type a line number, you can go to that line and stuff like that. And so exploring the machine. Uh, and then, you know, I think bulletin boards really sort of came around when I was in high school. I mean, obviously they existed before that, but they came more into the forefront when I was in high school. And this idea of being able to kind of take your creations and share them with other people. And so, you know, I wasn't just sharing code with people at school anymore. I was, you know, sending code out and there were some random things. There was a guy on our bulletin board in rural Maryland uh, who had been an Excel programmer at Microsoft. Uh, and so you can share code with him and be like, hey, what do you think of this? And and kind of talk to people that, you know, you wouldn't have been able to. Uh, and, it, you know, the, now this is all very normal. I mean, you can just go find people that you, you know, want to talk to on Twitter and ping them and maybe they'll talk yeah. to you. Whereas yeah. back then it was... It was, you know, it seemed like science fiction. Yeah. No, who would have thought that like you can just randomly ping people on Twitter and then convince them to talk to you for like an hour, right? That's absolutely crazy. I, I mean, yeah, it's it's funny because I think my first introduction to computers was um, an Apple as well. Like I remember being in kindergarten or first grade. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit younger than you. But it was like you could play like there was these word games that like had caterpillars in them. I can't remember what the name of the game was, obviously. But I would literally do everything that I could do to get to that computer first. So it's like, oh, if you finish like your little work assignments, you can go over there and do that. And and my parents, I think they figured out pretty quickly that I just liked computers and nerdy stuff. Like I was that kid that took apart the remote control cars and put them back together the first computer that we got, which was like a compact pavilion, like I took that apart like day two. My dad was like, put this back together immediately. And that was an enjoyable experience because again, like to your point, like there's not really instruction on how to put a computer back together, especially yep. like, you know, in the in the late 90s. Uh, yep. it's, it, it's definitely like that tinker mentality. It definitely seems like you have a lot of that too, right? Um, yep. And you mentioned something that I think is also quite interesting. Like you, you kind of equate you know, writing software or programming or to art, right? And I've said this a few times, like it is art. Like I've been very guilty of seeing like a chunk of code and I'm like, that is just beautiful. Like in, you know, my wife will laugh at me or something. It's like, no, but like you have to understand like there's elo there's like some elegance in it, right? There can be. And sometimes it's mechanical. You just turn it out and move on to the next problem. But, you know, that's kind of the you know, you have the ability to choose what you want your art to be. And there's people who build abstract art. There's people who mm -hmm. build abstract software. And so, you know, there's, I've definitely built tools that have, you know, a potential worldwide user base measured in, you know, the low dozens of people. Uh, and so, you know, but that doesn't mean you can't build something or invest a time that is wildly disproportionate to the, the potential reward just because yeah. you, you want to do it. Yeah, it's, I mean, that, that's very spot on. All right. So at eight or nine, you decided, okay, I'm going to be a developer. And then like, you know, you went through, you had typing class and I feel so sorry for that, that teacher, like 
somebody who obviously was just taking charge, right? Um, so what happened? I imagine then you wanted to go straight, like, university? Like, get, did you kind of do the path where you just started working in, in tech before school? Like, what was kind of the next so, step there? Um, there were a couple of things. Uh, so in that class, basically, we ended up doing uh, a couple of projects. So, you know, basically... I think my my uh, colleague slash uh, competitor ended up building, you know, like a breakout game and uh, started doing some like 3D model viewing stuff. Uh, he had found like, you know, a, a basically undocumented chip in the Apple II for doing animations. And so he was building stuff on that. And I was building uh, other kinds of uh, things in the Apple. And we moved on, I think they got 386s the following yep. year. And so we started writing code for Windows. And so mm -hmm. there were two major things that we did. Um, one was around, uh, we built, we called it Secure Shell. And the idea was basically uh, these machines were getting trashed because kids would go in and, you know, try and install their own games sure. or, um, you know, do things to change the configuration that made them unusable. And so we wrote a program manager. Program manager was like the explorer of Windows 3.1. So we wrote a program manager replacement called Secure Shell that basically locked the machines down, made it so you couldn't run any apps you weren't supposed to run, um, and so we built that for that teacher, actually. So she was pretty happy with us. Uh, and then we also started building some collaboration things. And so uh, built a chat system uh, so you could chat from computer to computer because that didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, and built some games uh, like you know Battleship and the like that you could play from computer to computer. Uh, so we did some projects there. Um, there, you know, looking back at my notes from that era, there were a few sort of potential work things. Uh, there was an ISP that needed somebody to build an installer. And so I got pretty late in the conversations with them. Um, but he and I both actually ended up, uh, kind of settling upon Delphi, which is an object Pascal based language. It's, it's kind of like visual basic, but it built native code and was way faster. Um, and so we started work at a computer, a small so custom software shop. Uh, in the city, um, we were making. I think minimum wage at the time was like four twenty-five an hour, and okay. we were making like eight fifty, I think, or maybe okay. nine fifty. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty good. I don't know what it was year pretty this good, was, but it sounds pretty good at the time. We, probably we did that for a couple months, and then our manager was like. I've decided I'm going to just start double billing for you. And we're like, what does that mean? And he's like, well, it means you make $19 an hour. Uh, and so I was like, okay. So that was that really good money at the time. Um, but in terms of school, you know, I didn't really give any thought to school. Like I'd always done pretty well in school. And so I didn't really like research or apply. Um, and so um, my parents were not really on my case about it. And so I didn't actually kind of, we went, they had a, a sleeping bag weekend at Carnegie Mellon. And so we went up there to see Carnegie Mellon. We both agreed, yeah, it looks pretty good. I think we were both mostly impressed that they had, you know, fiber internet at the time. So, you know, you're rocking along at your 33.6 modem at home and they had, you know, 100 megabit a second Wi-Fi or 100 megabit a second, not Wi-Fi yet, uh, just, you know, Ethernet. And so, because we had, we had mentioned Delphi to somebody there and uh, the guy downloaded Delphi, which at the time was like 70 megs, like instantly. And we were just, just dazzled. And so okay. I applied for Carnegie Mellon the day the application was due. Uh, didn't spend any real time on the application. Ended up getting waitlisted for computer science. Uh, and so I ended up going to University of Maryland, uh, which was kind of the, you know, the state school uh, yeah. instead. Yeah. And that went fine. Um, you know, I didn't have a great time in school. I didn't really didn't really blossom or flourish, I guess. But the one sure. thing that had happened was Microsoft came recruiting at Maryland. And the guy that Microsoft sent uh, to Maryland was a guy by the name of Philip Sue. Uh, Philip is moderately known in tech circles. He ran Facebook's London office for a while. Uh, but Philip was over the moon famous at Maryland because he had written the first, probably the first in the country, but if not one of the very first in the country, online course scheduling software packages oh, okay. where you could visit a website and input criteria like these are the classes I need. 
And then importantly, import constraints. Like I don't want to wake up before 10 a.m. Mm. And it would figure out a set of schedules that would work for you. So even now, that'd be a pretty substantial software package. But he had yeah. done it in 1996 or so and written it in C++ against you know, the front end. And uh, it would do back end communication with the mainframes that did core scheduling. So he was a legend. Sure. And he came out and did the talk. And so uh, my friend and I went and kind of were like, yeah, that sounds good. Sign me up. And so... Uh, to the on-campus interview at Microsoft, for Microsoft, I had brought sort of a binder of, you know, here's some side projects I had built yeah. and I included like a journaling program. I had a music program that would, um, it was you basically MP3s were all the rage. And so you'd basically set up your playlist, but it had features like you could do station breaks between songs and sort of be like, it's 604 and that was yeah. Aerosmith with no, don't want to miss a thing. And then uh, you could do, it would interact with like Windows power management. So like at the end of the playlist, it would turn the computer off and then wake the computer up the next morning to wake you up and stuff like that. And so they were pretty excited about that. Um, and so I came out in 99 and worked on the first version of what would become SharePoint. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there. I just <laughs> want to say that. There's, so there's a couple of things that I, I would love to kind of get your thoughts on. Sure. I, I think the first thing that really stuck out to me is that you were far more interested in using technology to solve problems than you were probably, I guess, your traditional academic track of computer science, right? Yep. Like I'm not Absolutely. just not to say that there is anything bad about, you know, the practical application of computer science, but it seems to me like you're very much more, hey, I can make somebody's life easier with tech. Right. Yep. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, it, and go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, it, I think of some examples like in our high school, we had a, a drama club and we had a large auditorium and every time they tried to sell tickets for that like it was a fiasco because it's all done on paper manually or whatever. And so I remember putting together, you know, a program for tracking seat sales. Sure. And I did a grade sheet for teachers to keep track of grades and things like that. So yeah, it was all, it was really about using technology to um, solve problems. And certainly at Microsoft at the time for program management in particular, that was sort of the core of what they were looking for. People who had a passion for technology because they believed it could be used to solve problems. Yeah, I think one thing as well that's really interesting about what you're saying is that, you know, it's the, it's a huge swath too of things that you, of problems you're looking to solve. Like some people, like they, you know, they they want to okay, maybe I'm just adding additional things to the operating system, or maybe I'm doing this. I think you were very much just like more of a generalist, right? Where you come across something, it's like, oh, I could probably do something, yep. and you know, you that's. In nowadays, like the idea of being a generalist where you can kind of hop in and out, like that's almost a requirement in tech, right? But I guess back then, like I, was tech a bit more specialist, at least in your view, from your viewpoint? It's hard to say. I mean, certainly things like Visual Basic, which, you know, was what I used prior to Delphi, would allow you, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, a lot of apps are basically just a little bit of code sitting on top of data. and. Yeah. You know, once I learned the database engine in, in VB and how to make forms, it was like, okay, you know, this grade sheet is really just kind of a variant of a recipe keeper, which is just mm -hmm. a variant of a journaling program, which is just a variant of a seat sales program. And so, like, you learn some common things and then, yep. you know, tailoring it to this specific ap application Um seems like a reasonable thing to do. And I mean, that's kind of the joke right now about Excel. Like you can use Excel to do any number of things, but it tends not to be very tailored to those tasks. And so, yes. you know, I think uh, one of the people I follow on Twitter sort of once made the observation of, you know, if you want to start a $100 million startup, a totally solid strategy would be to go into any large enterprise, find their most heavily used Excel spreadsheet and build your software yeah. about replacing that spreadsheet. And so... I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, you know, the, the generalism thing is is kind of an interesting question because, you know, it's it's where do you find the commonalities? And so there's people who, you know, to my point earlier, a lot of those apps are actually just variants of each other uh, yeah. in, in one way or another, if you choose to look at them that way. An alternative, I mean, and, and so kind of jumping ahead to the future a little bit. Um, Fiddler, like if you just sketch Fiddler on a sheet of paper and you could only do 12, you know, 12 lines, Fiddler is Outlook. 
On sure. the left hand side, you have a list of messages. And on yeah. the right hand side, yeah, you display those messages. And yeah. so, you know, you can you can choose to find commonality in, in these places and then and then kind of say they're all, you know, kind of in the same vein. Yeah, you just blew my mind. Sorry. Like Fiddler is Outlook. I'm sorry. Like we need to we need we need to pump the brakes for a little bit. I want to talk about Fiddler in, in a second. I I still kind of sure. want to get to like a little bit to your um kind of how you got to Fiddler, obviously, because I think, you know, Fiddler being this thing that in my opinion, and I don't want to, you know, um make you, you know, embarrass you, but it's like something that completely like changed the developer landscape, at least in my life. So um I think one of the things, like you, you when you you mentioned that, you know, when, when you're in university, um, you know, you weren't like you got, you know, waitlisted for the computer science program and all these sort of things. Did you actually have conversations with professors and you kind of talked about what you're interested in, and they were like, was there any? I guess what I'm trying to get to is like, did anybody at some point in time was like, okay, Eric, you you are going to be very successful in engineering. Like, did anybody no. do you that favor or was it? No, 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 definitely not. I mean, certainly there was encouragement from various quarters about topics, but like, I would say that my history professor, professor, my freshman year was, was more excited about my work than, than any computer science teacher I'd had at university. Um, there were a bunch of reasons for that. Maryland was a very large school. Most of my classes, particularly the early ones, had tons of students in them. And so, you know, contact between me and professors was entirely like in class. Um, and, you know, professors largely are looking for those people that are interested in sort of academia and doing well in, in academics. And so, um, you know, I was not interested in computer science theory and things like that. I was interested in, you know, building apps and going mm -hmm. to work for a company like Microsoft, who uh, one of the uh, one of my professors, uh, late in my tenure at Maryland was a defense or sorry, a, a witness for the prosecution in the trial against Microsoft. And so sure. that was always a little bit awkward, uh, because he was, you know, he was angry that I think his particular complaint was, you know, he was charged with, uh, you know, whether windows properly implemented the POSIX subsystem, and the Microsoft lawyers basically pulled out the POSIX spec and made him walk through and say, yes, it does implement that. Yes, it does implement that. Uh, and and he was sort of angry that uh, he, he had failed to sort of support the position that, you know, he was trying to make. But so most of my professors, the interactions were really awkward. Um, I became the student consultant to Microsoft uh, in my junior year, which basically is a program whereby Microsoft will pay one student on each campus to sort of arrange meetings, conversations with professors, uh, do talk, tech talks. Sure. Um, so basically you buy a bunch of pizza, reserve a room, and then yeah. give a talk about, you know, active server pages or whatever. Yeah. Um, I bought so much pizza, you know, basically every month I was buying like seven or $800 in pizza and Papa John's that when I graduated from university, my credit limit on my Amex was like $30,000, which was totally bananas. And, you know, I probably spent, you know, almost $10,000 on pizza. Um, but definitely, um, you know, I had some interactions with professors, but for the most part, I didn't really interact with professors. Um, I think, you know, during my my course picking my junior year, uh, the guy looked at my background and was like, wow, you're not in a hurry, are you? And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you haven't really taken any 300 and 400 level classes. And I was like, yeah, but, you know. I, it's my third year. Like, isn't this the year that I take yeah. the 300s, 400s? And I had sort of just taken this idea that you don't schedule three and 400 level classes until you were a senior. So sure. I had a very big senior year. I basically took, you know, four or five, maybe more, uh, 400 level classes uh, my senior year. And it was pretty, pretty hardcore. Um, but no, I, I, Microsoft kind of picking me from obscurity was in some ways the, oh, okay, maybe I'm not going to end up working yeah. for a little company near where I live. Yeah. I mean, like, did you struggle at all? It seems to me like, I, and maybe this is just me conflating kind of what you're talking about, but like, it seems to me like the problems you, you had already solved were probably substantially more challenging 
than a lot of, I guess, typical 300, maybe even 400 level computer science problems, right? At least like when I was in school, for instance, like one of the examples that we had to do was you had to like build an ATM using C, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like I think a lot of folks have done similar exercises as that, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, I think the different classes had different difficulties. Part of the problem that I had had was I, I was doing, you know, basically the most advanced math that I could in sure. high school at the time. And then I didn't touch math for a couple of years, basically. Uh, and so I had a calculus based statistics course that was a prerequisite for, uh, for graduation in computer science major. And I was taking it my senior year, having not touched calculus in, in more than three years. Uh, and, you know, on the first day, the professor was like, hey, you know, then we integrate this to this. Um, and she's like, anybody? And fortunately, everyone else was in the same boat. And so sure. I think the average grade that semester was like 30% and it got curved into passing. Sure. Um, but no, so like the, the coursework, um, and you know, I, I had been a Windows programmer, so you know, all of our courses were in Linux and uh, when Unix, I guess, at the time. And so, you know, there were some adjustment difficulties for that. Um, I was not an algorithms person, yeah. and so I found that incredibly tedious. Uh, and, and generally, like the mathematical proving of things was not very interesting. Um, but my senior year was really useful. Uh, because it was actually extremely hard and, and not always for the right reasons, but my operating systems class in particular um, was sort of known as an extremely hard class. And it was hard for some good reasons. It turns out it's hard to write an operating system uh, and some bad reasons, which thought? was basically uh, people... You know, at the at the time, they had had some policy of like, you know, if you talk to anybody about anything in your project, it's cheating, uh, which obviously is not super useful. But you know, at the time, there were just far fewer resources, uh, and the project had been reused uh, year after year uh, for probably a decade. And as a consequence, the people that were in charge of the TAs that were responsible for sort of running the project didn't really know how, you know, we got a memory manager, for instance, and they didn't know how it worked. Um, building the project required a compiler that was not legally available at the time. It was an outdated version of sure. the Borland C++ compiler. Um, and so that didn't go particularly well. Um, but I kind of actually blew that up because after the class ended, I published the full source of my project on the internet uh, for anybody to go download, which basically precluded them from ever using the project again because there was a fully working example of yeah. the work. And so uh, I actually got a very nasty letter from the dean of the computer science department threatening to throw me out of school. And I said, you can do that, but you know the hearing is going to be real interesting. Yeah, because, sure. Uh, there's there's some stuff going on that that made that inappropriate, and so the following year they actually changed over to uh, a different project based on Java, um, where it was sort of supported with a textbook and courses mm -hmm. and things like that. And so uh, ultimately, it's kind of funny because you know the conversation is, you know, coffee and open open source, and you know this is actually in some ways my first example of open source, but it wasn't yeah. intended as a collaborative thing. It was really intended to. Blow up this you know legacy project yeah i mean and that and that dovetails i think it like that comment especially to you know you joined microsoft you know in with the the early 2000s right like not the not a microsoft that people nowadays are familiar with right so like you're trying to navigate this thing you said you're working on sharepoint like how was that mm -hmm. first ex that experience for you kind of you know, being somebody who just solved all the problems themselves, typically going over to a company where a lot of, like the ability to delegate is really, really important. The ability to prioritize is really, really important, right? Like what were some of the things that you kind of learned as you went about that first little bit? I mean, the first thing that was really cool was just being around lots of super smart people yeah. uh, that were very real world. You know, we we're building products that are going to ship to millions of customers. And so like that was really cool to kind of see that and, you know, to get the inroads on new technologies um, because, you know, at the time Microsoft products were pretty expensive. And so, you know, you wanted to get the new version of Windows, it was going to be more than $100. So if you wanted to get the new version of the compiler, it was going to be hundreds of dollars. We didn't have VS Code. We didn't have the community editions of Visual Studio. Um, and so like getting access to tech was super cool. And it was funny. I remember 
after my first summer, I mailed the admin uh, back on uh, Microsoft and was like, hey, is there any way I can get a copy of Windows? And they had sent me like Windows Server 2000 Advanced Data Center Edition or something, sure. which retailed yeah. for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah. And it was kind of like this implied, please don't eBay this. But um, so the access to tech was was very cool. Um, the you know the, the project scoping like as an intern my project really had very little scope um sure. this was they just put sort of three teams together that were working on kind of web-based collab and they said you're going to be one product and so we you know i basically spent the summer sort of figuring out you know how's xml work how is it used uh and taking a look at some early competitive solutions around collaboration software the following year um, SharePoint actually had been named uh, and was starting to exist as a product. And I built uh, an approach for building templates. So you could build list templates. Uh, and so I wrote, I actually ended up writing the code that would generate the templates. And my intern dev wrote the code in SharePoint that would import the templates. And so, okay. you know, reasonably scoped projects. Uh, and then when I came on full time, um, I decided to switch to the Office Online team. Uh, and so I was going to be the clip art PM, uh, and then through a slightly amusing series of events, I ended up being their security PM as well. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like you got pretty, pretty quickly, a pretty good chunk of stuff, which I think, um, especially nowadays, like interns, like, and I don't want to disparage like the intern program in any of these big tech companies, but you're you're kind of you're given smaller scope stuff because the the understanding is is that not everybody gets gets started as fast as everybody, but it seems to me like you were kind of okay, Eric. Here you've proven yourself day one. Here take a substantial amount of work and, and go with it. And then obviously I think certain certain skills of yours kind of led you to taking other work in other areas that were probably were um, a bit more fitting. Yeah. I, and I mean, there's, there's also, you know, it's certainly true that not everybody ramps up at the same rate. Not everybody has the same skills. I mean, and, and internships have changed quite a bit too. Like it's not a joke that when I started at Microsoft, you basically got a box with parts to a computer and it was like, <laughs> you know, basically figure out how to put this together and then yeah. figure out how to get it on the network. And so you would spend time learning about, you know, authentication propagation delays and which resources required which type of authentication and, you know, things like that. And so, um, but, you know, there's always room to grow. And, and in particular, like if you're doing well on your project, there's always more work to be done. And so sometimes mm -hmm. it's about just finding, okay, well, if this guy finishes early, what's he going to do next? And, and there was some of that. Um, but my first summer was happy chaos, basically just drinking, drinking from the fire hose. Uh, they have tons of internal courses. And so you could just go off and take a class on UI design, take a class yeah. on C++, take a class on whatever. And that was part of the job. And, and while you're doing all this your you know, your time at Microsoft, I think, you know, I, I looked at your, your career history and you worked there for a little bit over 10 years, right? About 12 years yep. or so during that time you start to foray into different areas of tech that I think you kind of landed on. You started working on, um, you know, you started working on browsers a bit. You started working on the you know, components for the web. What was it about the web that really excited you? Or was it just happenstance that you just kept on getting put on stuff that was security related, networking related? You know, is it an, in was it an interest initially or was it something that you just kind of fell into projects and you kind of developed a, a skill set? Yeah, so that's kind of a fun question. Um, a lot of it was accidental. Certainly there's truth that once you've done one thing, people will kind of look at you for adjacent things. Um, but it's it's sort of funny. I, I, I recently used this example, and the more I think about it, the more apt it seems. But me coming to work on the browser was very much like the end of a romantic comedy where, <laughs> you know, the, the guy and the girl has spent the whole movie sort of dancing around each other, all around each other, but they never sort of realize, oh, my God, we're in love. Um, and that's kind of where I was. So I started building extensions for the browser in 1995. Uh, there was a very lightweight extensibility model in the very early versions of Internet Explorer. And you could do things like integrate 
you know, look this term up in a dictionary and stuff like that. And so sure. I was releasing browser extensions in 97. Uh, I had written a pop-up blocker back before Internet Explorer had one. Went to some success, including uh, it was the most popular pop-up blocker in Brazil because it was the only one localized to Brazilian Portuguese. Sure. Uh, so there were some funny stories like that. But I was doing a lot of stuff that was browser related um, back before browsers were terribly a big thing. Yeah. Um, and so SharePoint, you know, I kind of fell into SharePoint because the other team that I had been offered um, had already sort of declared code complete. And yeah. so it was like, well, I could be a PM on a project that's not done or a PM on a project that is done. I feel like going to the project that's not done yeah. seems like it'd be better. Um, and, you know, my first sort of exposure to what would turn into, you know, a, a career that led to Fiddler was one of my final interviews on the SharePoint team was my manager to be said, how does HTTP work? And I was like, uh, and, you know, kind of went through an explanation that was apparently good enough to get hired. Um, but, you know, it was one of those things of like, yeah, how does HTTP work? Uh, and so... Yeah. You know, I was around web tech and, you know, this was, you know, just before the dot-com boom or just around the dot-com boom. So it was pretty obvious that the web was going to be, you know, pretty important. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a, a very broad understatement, right? How much impo how important the browsers are today. And I think through that, I'm guessing at this point in time, you started to play or like towards the end of your time at Microsoft, you started playing around with the idea of Fiddler, um, you know, and you know, building kind of a debugging utility for people who are, you know, as the as the web became more and more like the canonical platform for building apps. Do you want to talk a little bit about the origin of Fiddler and, and we can kind sure. of drill into some stuff too? Yeah, so it was actually way at the beginning of my tenure at Microsoft. Okay. Uh, so, you know, the story about how I became a security PM was when I was changing to the office online team, my new manager called me in my dorm. And while we were talking about this job being the Clipart PM, my computer said with Majel Barrett's voice, Shields Holding. And he was like, what was that? And I was like, oh, that's just my computer. Uh, there's a worm that's running around on Microsoft uh, on University of Maryland's campus right now. So I wrote an ISAPI filter that watched for the attack string. And when it sees it, it blocks it and it plays Shields Holding. And so he goes, oh, cool, you'll be our security PM too. And I laughed. <laughs> and I showed up at Microsoft and, you know, we talked about the clip art job. And then he said, and, you know, you'll be our security PM. And I was like, I thought you were joking. joking. He was like, no. And he's like, um, I was like, I don't really know anything about security. And he's like, well, nobody else does either. And so he handed me Michael Howard's book about writing secure code. And he's like, you get to learn. And so I spent that summer uh, taking over computers with Clipart. Um, sure. But in the course of that, uh, one of Hey folks, Isaac here. We had a little bit of technical difficulty and we're going to fast forward to the point in our conversation when Eric, after talking about Fiddler's origin, uh, started to talk about the idea of having it available for free as freeware. So fast forward into that part. Hope you enjoy. Thank you. And we're back. I have no idea what just happened. Thank you for your patience, Eric. Um, yeah, so one of the things that we were talking about right when things started to get weird for me, I don't know for folks on stream uh, if their experience was the same, but you were kind of talking about the, the or like we were talking a little bit about the origin story of, of Fiddler and then kind of making that uh, transition of like, you know, talking about having it be really, really good freeware. So if you kind of just want to yeah. summarize that again, that would be super helpful. Yeah. So, I mean, basically because I was working, I mean, I'd been releasing freeware for more than a de almost a decade at that point. And so like that felt kind of natural. Uh, the fact that I was working at Microsoft making more money than I thought I was ever going to make uh, felt like, you know, I don't need the money. Um, and so there was also this aspect of, you know, being unclear about the legal status of Fiddler. Uh, and it sort of became this sort of don't ask, don't tell thing where, uh, I, you know, I was actually worried for a while that one day people would just show up and be like, Hey, we're really angry about Fiddler and you're fired. Uh, I, you know, there was a period of time when I tried to get Microsoft to actually take explicit control of, of Fiddler. And so, uh, in particular, just before I went over to the internet Explorer team, um, 
the, I contacted, I sent mail over to the Visual Studio guys and was like, hey, I've got this thing. It seems pretty popular. It seems pretty useful. Uh, and got back a very sort of non-committal response. And so uh, when I joined the IE team, they were like, yeah, you should get rid of Fiddler because we're not going to have time for that over here. And I said, well, that's one possible outcome. Uh, and in reality, what I sort of predicted would happen happened, which was basically all the IE testers started using Fiddler extensively. Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, I don't think you probably envisioned just the, the, the traction that it got. And I don't know if it's because it, if it's ease of use or if it's just, it was one of the first kind of tools to kind of do it. I mean, I, I just don't remember like the time before, like how, like, cause yep. at least like I would do lots of like, you know, response to our right lines and stuff like that to kind of like debug my experiences. And, um, yep that was kind of replaced like you know what was some of the initial feedback that you were getting you know once you the tool became a bit more used like i i I imagine that at the end of the day like there was a ton of just please thank you so much for bringing something like this to me make my life easier so uh, feedback varied wildly i mean ease of use is funny because um fiddler by some measures was extremely easy to use and by other measures was extremely complicated to use. And it largely depended on what you wanted to do with it. Um, and so um, ultimately part of the reason I ended up writing a Fiddler book was uh, around 2011, uh, Fiddler was an acquisition target and there was a company that wanted to buy it. And I met with them and they had two product managers that had been looking at it for six months and I watched them use it. And I was horrified and I was like, oh my God, you think you have to do that to do this simple thing? Like <laughs> sure. clearing the session, clearing the session list, like control X from day one, baby. But, um, you know, they were clicking into four menus and, and, you know, select all, and then, you know, all this other stuff. But I was like, oh my God. And I was like, well, how would you know that you could do? And so I ended up writing a book because I felt like, Hey, you know, people don't understand how to use it. And it's my fault. Uh, and in the course of doing that, I sort of discovered what I call book driven development, which is, you know, mm-hmm. I'd be like, oh, what's a hard thing to do? And I'd go write three pages about how to do, you know, authentication responses. And then I was like, but now that I've really thought about that problem, I feel like I understand it a lot better and it should just be a checkbox. And so I'd go code up a checkbox and it would take, you know, half an hour or whatever. And then I'd have to go delete three pages of the book in order to sort of get to that, uh, you know, the reality that it was no longer necessary. And so ease of use, you know, definitely variable depending on what you wanted to do. Most people use Fiddler very, very shallowly. And for, you know, just seeing the requests and responses very quickly, it was way easier than almost everything else on the market. And so, you know, when I talked about those days of hovering over variables in Visual Studio, uh, clearly way more powerful and easy to use than that. But the other alternative was Microsoft Netmon, which yep. at the time was version two and just unbelievably high <laughs> learning curve. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the other piece about quality is, you know, I, I talked about this recently. Um, I subscribe to a broken windows theory of software. Sure. And so as a technique for policing, broken windows is, you know, under disrepute at this point, but for bugs in software, I think it really is valid. And that is to say, if you have obvious bugs in your software that are just front and center, people assume, oh, this is buggy software. Yep. And they won't bother to report more interesting bugs that they encounter later because they're like, yeah, this thing barely works at all because look at that menu. It's not even in the right place. And so I always had a passion for basically fixing things as soon as people reported them. Mm -hmm. And that also was part of the reason why Fiddler didn't have a bug tracker, because people would send me an email and say, hey, this is broken. Uh, I'd send an email back, download the new version. Um, And so it was a very productive uh, way to improve the software quickly by giving it away, letting people report things, basically kind of chiding people to report things and saying like, hey, you know, you think you may think that you're bothering me by reporting bugs, but actually what you're doing is you're making it. So, you know, you're giving me a reason to, to keep doing this. Like the reason to give away software for free is to make that software better. And that was also part of the argument when, you know, I, I came around to Fiddler being acquired, you know, part of the reason why they were willing to acquire Fiddler was one that, you know, the brand recognition, but two, the fact that, you know, at the time that Fiddler was acquired, it was getting downloaded 14,000 times a day. 
And yeah. it turns out it's very hard to get people to download software 14,000 times a day sure. if it's incredibly buggy. And, you know, it becomes this proof point of people are using it. So, you know, the issues have been worked out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty impactful just the, the scope of Fiddler too. Like, so we had somebody in our chat, DVS, just said, uh, Fiddler was used extensively for Link Skype and a bit on Teams too. So like, you know, Teams internally at Microsoft you know, using uh, a, an open source tool or a freeware tool to, um, to, to I guess, build and test, you know, commercial products, right? Like, and I imagine that you're, you probably know all sorts of amazing users of Fiddler that nobody else probably knows, right? Because they, you know, they probably had Eric tech support on, uh, on, yep. on speed. Dump. So, Definitely knew a lot of people that were using it. I mean, one of the key bits is, you know, initially, again, Fiddler was built to debug clip art. And yeah. as a consequence of that, it really was tailored for that notion. But simultaneously, there were things, and, and really a lot of Fiddler's power comes out of its extensibility. And, you know, it's funny, early on you said, you know, open source. And, and Fiddler wasn't open source, but it almost felt like it because Fiddler was so extensible and offered so many different places that you could plug in your code and you could share that code with the community that it did have sort of an open source following around it, even if the open source was around those extensions and around those scripting capabilities. But the reason that Fiddler had a scripting engine was Microsoft at the time was using, um, it was either Product Studio or its predecessor RAID. And you could build queries to search for bugs of, you know, show me bugs that are older than 10 days old that are not fixed and are, you know, of a certain level of importance. And it was this drop down of combo boxes. And I thought about the task of building sort of this arbitrary drop down of combo boxes in a UI and was like, oh, this is so much work. It's going to be really tedious. It's like, it'd be better if you just express your query in like JavaScript or something. Yeah. And then it was around that time that, I can't remember there was just MSDN documentation or MSDN magazine. It was like, add a scripting engine to your app. And I was like, yeah. well, that would be perfect. And it <laughs> sure. took Fiddler from something that was, um, you know, not very broadly useful and made it broadly useful. Uh, yeah, and I so mean, in terms of use, yeah, there were yeah. a lot of fun stories and it was used very broadly. One of the pieces uh, just before I left Microsoft, we had an internal leaderboard of internal tools and Microsoft had 35,000 people that had used Fiddler, um, which at the time was somewhere over a third of the company. And we did not have 35,000 web developers at the time. So that kind of boggled the mind. And, you know, there were other anecdotes. Um, one time the chief software architect at Microsoft called me up about some bug in IE and, you know, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to ask you to download this tool called Fiddler. And, you know, I started explaining, he's like, I already use Fiddler all the time. I send my <laughs> Zoom bug reports with Fiddler captures. And so I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, there were fun stories like that. Yeah, that's great. I think too, one thing that's also very, very interesting about Fiddler is just, you know, it has lived on for a, a long time and there's there's all there's a ton of other tools in this space now but it seems to me at least in my workflow like one of the first things that I do when I stand up a new machine is okay I go and I download fiddler right mm -hmm. you know it's and and I think that really shows like the longevity of like a product you know and you mentioned earlier like fiddler is just outlook like i mean it's it's funny how that 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 i guess that way that you view tools where it's like list of things on the left hand side meat of the thing of the detail on the right hand side like i guess a lot of folks brains work very well like that you see that with you know commonly with ides you see it with so what was I, i'd love to get to get your thoughts is like when you're initially building it and like did you get solicit feedback from anybody like or was it like once people started using it they would give you feedback it was, I mean, it was mostly like, you know, I would have, you know, the crash dialogue basically was like, here, hit control C to copy this and, you know, mm -hmm. send me mail. Um, but I was pretty, you know, open about the idea of like, send me feedback. Um, and, you know, at the time it was largely because there were some obvious gaps. Um, and so I always kind of felt like, hey, show me what I'm missing. Uh, yeah. In part, it was because there were scenarios where Fiddler was close, but not quite there. Yeah. And learning about those, you know, there were some major features in Fiddler that were added 
because somebody randomly said, Hey, wouldn't it be better if X? I'm like, Oh my God, yes. And so like, sure. I definitely had a lot of those and a lot of the value of Fiddler came from that feedback. And, you know, I also leaned on at the time the message of like, you know, the value I get out of you running this code is you telling me what I should fix. And so uh, I was pretty, you know, I, I asked for feedback pretty hardcore. Yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, as we're, we're getting close to the, the end of our time, like I would love to transition to some of the stuff that you're working on these days, right? Like, sure. um, you know, maybe talk a little bit about what you're doing, um, you know, currently, I know you're back at Microsoft and, yep. you know, some of the things that you're trying to bring to the web. So, so I left Microsoft uh, in 2012 when Fiddler was acquired by Telerik. I worked there for a couple of years. I worked on Chrome security for a couple of years. I came back to work on Edge uh, on the web platform, pretty much the same job I had had when I left the company in 2012. Uh, except the day after I got back, or maybe it was the day before I got back, I got a lengthy PDF, which was... What would happen if we threw away all the code we've been working on for 20 years and instead shipped Chromium? And I said, that's a fantastic idea. Um, and part of the reasoning behind that was, you know, people talk about engine diversity and browsers. And, and really what IE had was bug diversity. Mm -hmm. We had lots of very buggy code that had been around for a very long time. And I wanted to get rid of that legacy as quickly as I could. Um, but also from having worked on Chromium, I became much more convinced of the value of open source, uh, both in you know the way that open source is able to leverage contributions from all over the place, uh, as well as some of the sort of mindset behind running a successful open source project that just makes it more useful for everybody. Uh, and then maybe even partly from the fact that because Fiddler wasn't open source, I couldn't keep contributing to it. And so sure. that felt kind of like sad and unnecessary. Like Telerik, I think, would have benefited from me keeping, you know, continuing to send them patches. Um, and so we replatformed the top Chromium and, you know, invested a ton. And, you know, we weren't slapping, you know, a Microsoft logo on the Chromium browser. We actually yeah. put, you know, a very, very big team, bigger than the team that built the old edge. Uh, on the new browser to to go make it great. And so um, I spent my first year or two back sort of helping people get up to speed on the Chromium engineering system and the concepts and the code and things like that. And then I spent about a year working with enterprises to sort of get them moved over from their legacy IE stuff. Uh, and then this past year, I've been kind of flitting all over the place, uh, working in privacy and, and things like that. So um, folks may have heard about this idea that Chrome has this privacy sandbox they're investing in. And the idea is to try and make the browser uh, help enforce privacy in a way that it hasn't historically due to some of the architectural uh, shortcomings of the way that the web works with privacy. And so uh, that entails breaking changes. And so like, for instance, there's a plan to phase out third party cookies in the browser, and that's going to have huge impacts. And so we have to find new technologies that allow people to replicate the necessary things uh, that they need to do uh, without the same privacy impact. And so I've been working on some, some features related to things like that. That's great. So, I mean, like, I think the decision to go from, you know, the, the, I guess, I can't remember what it's called, Spart Sparta, Spartan? Spartan. Yeah, yeah, Spartan to that engine to Chromium. It, when, I, when I remember it, it being announced, my first thought was, okay, that sounds substantially easier experiences. Like as a developer who might want to build extensions for browsers, makes my life substantially easier, right? Um, you know, you know so what are some of the things that you've kind of heard from the developer community, who folks who want to extend browsers, right? Is it just yeah. just giving making their lives easier because the platforms are now very similar from like an extension perspective? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's different like the old Spartan had adopted the extensions model from Chromium uh, and and the new Firefox model um, before we switched to Chromium. But what you got was a much higher quality implementation when we moved over to the Chromium version. And so people were like, oh, I don't have to worry about this bug or this shortcoming in the web platform. Um, so yeah, it made life a lot easier for web developers. It was a similar story. Um, where they were like, oh, you know, I no longer have to worry about this weird laggard browser. Um, 
some some features were um, regressed. And so, you know, things like accessibility support and some of the inking and scrolling support in the new Chrome when we first moved over uh, were not as good as they were in Spartan. And we basically spent, you know, the other parts of the team spent significant time at the beginning going and, and bringing that expertise and technology. And so, for instance, um, Microsoft has several owners in Chromium for accessibility. So sure. when Chrome and Chromium need better accessibility support, it's our our folks that are, are working on that. Um, and so overall, I think people are happy. There are people who are, you know, they worry about browser mo monocultures, and there's reason to worry about that. Um, but, you know, the answer is not to maintain the old version it's to you know make sure that we are uh we have agency is what we like to call it basically yeah. the ability to go a different direction if we want and we we have that and we've done some things like we think the storage access api is interesting and so even though uh chrome does not want to support that feature uh we implemented it mm -hmm. uh we have things like tracking prevention which is an approach for attempting to limit third-party tracking on the web and so we ship that in in edge uh, and there's a ton of UX stuff that we've done that is sort of philosophically a bit different than what Chrome has done. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think one thing that's really, really important to call out is just because they use the same underlying engine doesn't mean that the browsers are going to always be the same, right? Google's going to make decisions that are that's best going to bring value to their product and Microsoft's going to do the same thing. And I think, yep. you know, it's, it's only the, the benefit is the developer, right? Who wants to build and extend that platform, right? Because now they don't have to write the same extension using multiple th avenues, right? Also, yep. from like a security perspective, like you know, the 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 I guess the attack plane is substantially smaller between, you know, maybe you you disagreed immediately, so, so like it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's very complicated to talk about security. I think yeah. I would say that Chromium has some best in class technology for doing browser security. And so, you know, they have a great sandbox and they have a bunch of strategies around doing, um, trying to use the language as safely as they can. Yeah. Um, but, and, and we had some great technologies, like from a security point of view, the old Spartan actually had some very interesting security technologies, leveraging some of the features of windows and new processors. And so one of the things we've done much like accessibility is we've helped bring some of those technologies over to Chromium. And so, you know, with attack surface, it's a little bit tricky because if you go from two browsers to one browser, uh, in some ways you're you're reducing the attack surface, uh, but also you're you're losing the benefit of you know a diversity in some respects. Yeah. Like if there was a bug in in Chromium, uh, we have that bug now too. Yep. Um, but, you know, it also kind of gets back to that, you know, open source concept of um, certainly we have fixed bugs in upstream Chromium related to security. And so we do get to benefit and Chrome and Google gets to benefit from having more security engineers poking more holes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Thank you for kind of immediately correcting that that statement. Right. I appreciate it's it. Just because... no, I mean, it's just controversial. No, I think I think also, too, I think also, too, there's something to say about you know, like you mentioned about the downstream, you know, or the upstream, um, you know, recommitting, right? Like, I think that's yep. one of the, the stewards of like good open source adoption for like these big enterprises, right? Is, you know, yep. instead of just forking and then building their stuff, like, yes, fork and build your stuff, but make sure that you're continually getting back to the source. Because if, you know, if Microsoft finds a security vulnerability early, and they're able to, to patch it, you know, it, it only benefits Chrome and, and other browsers that take advantage of the yep. engine, right? Yep. And, and from the web platform team, it's not just security, it's, it's functionality and features yeah. too. Um, I mean, we have a couple of things. Like the main reason that we abandoned the old Spartan was around web compatibility and mm -hmm. the fact that it was it looked impossible to sort of get to 100% web compatibility. And so if we go introduce something new in the platform and don't bring it upstream, don't at least offer it upstream, like we could end up in a position where we sort of recreate compat problems and nobody wants that. And so yeah. there's an altruistic aspect of bringing fixes upstream, but there's also just the very pragmatic, like we want a consistent web platform it's what developers value. And so we on the platform team try to bring everything we can upstream and not everything gets accepted in places. Like I mentioned, if there's a philosophical difference in, of opinion, um, 
But, you know, I mean, some things like storage access API is upstream. It's just not turned on. And so sure. if another Chromium consumer wants to turn it on, it's just a, fl a flag away. Yeah, I mean, and that's and that thing that goes to just the, the beauty of the engine, right? Like if you want to light something up that's available, that's not turned on by default in a browser, like you have the option to yep. do so. Your mileage may vary heavily though, right? Yep. I think that's always the, the, the trade-off. Um, so, you know, we're, I think it's a good, uh, point for us to kind of wrap up. I, I, Eric, I want to thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me about all sorts, you know, your history in tech, you know, the web space is what it is right now. And obviously everybody's favorite web debugging tool fiddler. Um, do you have any parting words before we be, sign off? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I guess the, the thing that I would say is, you know, Chromium is open source. Uh, it's super easy to contribute. I'll, I'll work uh, to, to get you two links that I wrote yep. about sort of the lightest way to get involved in Chromium and get your fixes and, and, you know, basically change the world for a billion people with, you know, nothing more than a web browser and, you know, some time. You should work in marketing. That pitch was really, really good. <laughs> Just, you know, you know if, this, if this if this web platform stuff doesn't work out for you, I think you can definitely do some stuff in marketing for sure. Awesome. So at the, at the end of our, our chat, I always love to ask my guests if they can, you know, if they can, you know, summarize, you know, your opinion of tech and open source and just the community that's around it and your experiences, you know, if you only had one word to do it, what would that word be for you? A single word? Man. Yeah. Yeah. A, a word. A word no, is hard. No free lunch um, around here. I'm going to say optimism. Optimism. Uh, optimism is my word. Um, and, you know, if I if I were asked to explain optimism, uh, you know, open source really is predicated on optimism of I can make the world a better place by contributing. And, you know, the the idea of allowing other people to build on it is the most impactful way of doing that. And so I think open source is inherently optimistic and that's super valuable. I mean, I totally agree. The whole reason why I do this this show is because I have faith in humanity and tech. You know, sometimes I think we we it's hard to see the forest through the trees when we're always yep. complaining about all the different stuff. But I, yep. you know, back to the conversation at the beginning, right? Like your origin in tech was trying to solve problems for folks, and because tech yep. enables that so rapidly. Um, so again, Eric, I want to thank your time. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. For everybody else tuning in, thank you. And, and apologize for the little hiccup in here. Um, be sure to get that fixed and sent out via the podcast and all that stuff. So uh, for everybody tuning in, thank you again. And this is Isaac Levin, Coffee and Open Source. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.